Well, we're in week number seven of our series, Strength in Weakness, and uh, we've talked about it every week, and I, I hate to lead off with such an encouraging uh, word this morning, but we're all going to face tough times in our life, right? We're all going to face uh, trials, and when we do, when we face the, the struggles of life, the hard times in life, uh, most, if not all of us, have that one person or those few people who we call during those times, when we don't know what to do, when we're looking for wisdom, when we need an outside opinion besides ours, when we need some counsel, we have that person who we call, or those few people who we call. I have different mentors. There are about four people who I, I can call at any moment, when I'm going through something that I don't know what to do, something that's bigger than me, people that I can call that I trust their counsel, uh, but my dad is almost always my first call. I know that he wants the, the best for me. I know that he's often been through the exact things that I'm going through, and I know that he came out on the other side with his life and his marriage and his ministry intact, and sometimes I just need him to tell me that that's how it's going to be, that you can come out of the other side, and so a lot of times he'll be my He'll be my very first call because I want to know how he did that. Like, I'm glad that you made it, but I need to know how I can do it. And so I'll call him and uh, get insight into my situation. I want to know what does he think? What does he see that I cannot see? Because if you have kids, then you know that you can just see things that they can't see yet. And one day, they'll be able to see those things, and they'll be able to pass those things on. But I want to know what, what does he see that... I can't see. What do I need to change? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to keep doing and do more of? And if you're following the biblical plan for a Christian life, then you need to have someone uh, who's a believer and a follower of Jesus. You need to have someone speaking into your life, someone who you want to learn from. In our text today, Paul becomes that person for us. He's the wise counsel who we get to learn from he's been through a lot of stuff he came out on the other side his love for the church cannot be questioned in our text today he's going to give some counsel to the church that stands the test of time about how you can make it through a season of personal weakness and pain and the strength of god this morning we're going to talk about godly advice from a great apostle godly advice from a great Apostle. We're going to cover uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 18. And like we often do with this much scripture, we're going to stop and go uh, as we go through it. And what we're going to do as we touch each verse this morning is we're going to talk about uh, seven pieces of advice that Paul gives the church that I think are still really good for us in our life. Uh, whether we're experiencing weakness in, in that kind of season or not, I think that it's good advice for us. But especially if we're in a season where we need to find some strength, then it's good, godly advice uh, from uh, probably the greatest apostle. Okay, uh, Thing number one we find in verse number seven. Verse seven says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God, and not of us, that the excellence of the power may be of who? God, and not of us. The, the first piece of advice that Paul gives here is get over yourself. Man, our lives would just be so much better, just in general, if we could just take that advice and hold on to it tight. Just get over yourself. What Paul's basically saying in verse number 7 is, we have this treasure in our mortal bodies to show us the excellent power of God and not of ourselves. That the power that we have isn't from us, but it's from God. God. What is the treasure here that Paul is talking about? Well, he's talking about the ministry of the gospel. We know that because we've talked about it uh, in the previous, in the last couple of weeks. We have this message of Jesus. We have the good news of the gospel in these earthen vessels. Another version says that we have this treasure, right? We have this message of the gospel. Other versions say in jars of clay. 
and jars of clay. Fragile things were jars of clay. They were disposable in that day. If you can remember back to the attacks that were made on Paul by the Judaizers in Corinth, they attacked him personally based on his speaking ability and his appearance. And there's a lot of conjecture about what uh, Paul looked like, and none of it is really great. By all accounts from theologians, Paul uh, was not the best-looking guy. In fact, there's even some New Testament evidence that he was hard to look at, right? He, he talks about that in some of our letters. He said, you didn't turn your face from me. You would, you would look at me, and I appreciate that. So he wasn't the, the best-looking guy. They attacked him because of the way that he looked, and they also attacked him because of the way that he spoke, his, you know, his preaching. And we talked about that several weeks ago. They say that he writes a powerful letter, that Paul can really pen a letter, but when you hear him in person, he's pretty unimpressive, and it actually says that his teaching or his preaching amounts to nothing. I think we talked about that week one or week two. If you really want to stick the dagger into a preacher and, and twist it, tell him that his preaching's no good. Right? Your preaching amounts, I can't imagine, I, I really can't imagine how painful it would be for someone to come up to my face and say, man, you're really ugly. And if that wasn't enough, your preaching is terrible. It, it actually is of absolutely no value whenever you preach. I can't imagine how much that would hurt, but that's the attack, the accusation that's been levied against Paul. And I love how Paul responds to that attack here by saying, I have this great treasure in this earthen vessel, in this mortal body. What's he saying? He's saying, you're right. I'm not perfect. I, I have flaws. I make mistakes. I'm not the biggest. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the best looking. I don't have the most money. And that is what God, you, that's what makes it so amazing that God chooses to use me. This great gift of the gospel God has given me with all my flaws and with all my failures to show that the power that's flowing through me isn't from me, but it's from God. He says, you attack me because my speech isn't eloquent and I'm not the best looking guy. If I was perfect, you may think that the power was from me and from my charisma. And so he says, thank God I'm not perfect. Philippians 3 verses 4 through 7, Paul gives his earthly resume and the things that he's done and who he is. It's pretty Impressive. Verse number four says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And then he goes on to list all the reasons why he's awesome in the flesh. Verse number five says, Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Verse number 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted as total loss. So Paul could have stood up for himself against the Judaizers, against to the people in Corinth. That's our, our natural bent when we feel like we're being attacked is to stand up for ourselves. If anyone had the right to take pride in their flesh, it was... Paul, but get this, Paul wasn't stuck on himself. Paul knew that he was messed up. He knew he had a tough past. He knew that the only thing that was good in him was Jesus. And so instead of trying to hide his imperfections, he actually went the opposite way and he embraced his imperfections. Here's the thing, we're not perfect either. But our nature is to want people to believe that we are. It's okay to say amen right there. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But our nature is to want people to believe that we are. But when we project perfection, it actually hinders the message of the gospel. 
We think that people will respect us more if they don't know about our failures, and maybe it will cause them to respect you more, but it will not help them relate to you on a better level because they know that they're broken and they know that they're messed up. And so when people who are outside the church, when people who are unbelievers look into the church and all that they see is projected perfection, they feel like they can never stack up, they feel like they can never meet that criteria and so they stay away from the church because they know how messed up they are and Paul goes completely the opposite way and he says you're right I'm messed up I'm flawed I'm broken and I have this great treasure in this flawed and broken vessel that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Paul could have tried to defend himself instead he got over himself and chose to defend the power of God working through him and I wonder how much time we spend trying to defend and promote ourselves that should be spent trying to promote the gospel of Jesus. Paul says, I'm a clay pot, I'm not worth very much, I'm disposable, I'm fragile, but what's inside of me is powerful and eternal and strong where I am weak. Paul refuses to diminish the gospel so that he can glorify Himself, He has to come to a place where he, he can truthfully say, it's not about me, it's all about Jesus. There are people in the church who won't step up and lead. There are people in the church, and I mean the big C church, not just our church, but the bride of Christ who won't make disciples, who are making disciples. And it's not, I don't think that it's mostly because they don't want to. I don't think that it's mostly because they don't care. I think it's mostly because they think that they're not good enough mostly because they think that they're not adequate. And if you could really get a hold of this one and just get over yourself, because really your adequacy and your power isn't about you and how good you are and how much scripture you have memorized and how long you've been coming to church, it's actually all about Jesus. And so when we shift our focus away from ourselves and onto Jesus, we feel empowered to do all kinds of things because we know that he is good enough, he's big enough, he's strong enough, and he will anoint us to do what he called us to do. But before you can do any of that, First, you have to get over yourself. Verse number 8 and 9 says, We are hard-pressed on every side. This is one of the the all-time great verses in 2 Corinthians. He says, We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul doesn't deny the hard realities of life number two the second piece of advice that we get from the apostle this morning is life is hard how you respond is your choice life is hard but how you respond is your choice paul says we're hard pressed on every side he says we are we're perplexed and we're persecuted and we're struck down paul has so much going on in his life that he can't just pick one thing that's messed up right now so he goes on and he lists four things that are all messed up in his life in that moment what he's trying to get the church to see is that you can't always choose what happens to you paul didn't strike himself down Paul didn't persecute himself. How many of you know that sometimes life just happens and sometimes life stinks? Sometimes life just happens and sometimes life is tough. Sometimes people are mean. Sometimes work isn't good. Sometimes marriage is hard. Sometimes raising kids is painful. Sometimes helping raise your adult parents is painful. Come on. I'm looking down at my notes. I'm not staring at anybody. You can't just stop all the things in life from happening, but you can always choose how you respond to what happens to you. Paul says we're hard-pressed on every side. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like there were problems all around you and then there was absolutely nothing else that could go wrong and then the car breaks down? It's just life. Hudson Taylor was in a late 1800s, early 1900s British, British 
missionary. Try to say that ten times fast. British missionary. And he said this. It does not matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Whether it comes between you and God or whether it presses you nearer his heart. I want you to think about it. That's profound. Doesn't matter what the pressure is or how much pressure there is. What matters is the placement of the pressure. If it's between you and God or if it's pushing you closer to God, that truth will stand the test of time. I've watched in ministry as people have faced the hardest things that life can possibly give them and there is one almost universal truth and it's when people face pressure they either lean into God and get closer to him or they turn and they run the opposite way but very rarely maybe never the people face the pressures of life and the hard things of life and stay at the exact same place in their relationship with God you're either going to get closer to him or you're going to get farther away and it's all based on your response to the pressure that's coming. Paul says we're hard pressed all around, but the devil hasn't crushed us. Paul compares us to a clay pot. When you put pressure on a clay pot, do you know what happens to it? It breaks. He says, but there's actually pressure all around us, but we haven't broken yet. We haven't been crushed Yet, What Paul is saying here is that the power of God inside of his flawed body is stronger than any pressure from the outside can ever be. Life happens, certainly, but Paul says, I'm still standing. I haven't been broken by life yet. He goes on to say, we're perplexed, but we still have hope. We're perplexed. We're confused about why this is happening. Have you ever asked God, why is this happening to me? Me and Rob. <laughs> Have you ever just gone to God in a moment of vulnerability and said, I don't understand how any good can possibly come of this. I don't understand your way right now. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand the plan that you seem to have that's unfolding before me right now in front of my life. Why? But Paul says here it's, it's so good he says that even in his confusion he will not despair even when he asks the question why he will not give up hope because paul knows that it's better to have peace than knowledge it's better to have the peace of god than the knowledge about what is going on in our lives i may not know why but i still have hope and peace that comes from god inside of me life is hard sometimes but how we respond to it matters paul says we are persecuted but jesus is still standing with us we're persecuted but we have not been abandoned by jesus it was likely said that the reason that paul was being persecuted was because god had forsaken him because paul had done something wrong and he's saying no i'm i'm being persecuted yes but that doesn't mean that god has forsaken me that doesn't mean that he has abandoned me he says we've been hit hard and we've fallen but we're back up again and we're going to keep fighting is the pain real yes does it hurt yes but the stakes are too high for us to retreat in fact we have to press through the pain all the more until we tap into the supernatural power and anointing of the holy spirit because if god didn't have a crazy awesome plan for my life then the enemy wouldn't be fighting me this hard verses 10 through 12 says always caring about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life of jesus also be may be manifested in our body for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. The third piece of advice that we get from Paul this morning is this. You won't attain the promise if you won't pay the price. You won't attain the promises of God if you won't pay the price. Paul says we are being delivered to 
death for the sake of Jesus. Then he goes on to say, so that the life of Jesus, so that Jesus may be manifested in our lives. In no uncertain terms, Paul is saying that sometimes we go through things in life that are specifically designed to show off the power of God working in and through our lives. We asked it in week number one, but it fits here, so we'll ask it again. Is it okay if God uses your pain for His purposes? Is it okay if God uses your pain, your trial, your weakness to accomplish what He wants to accomplish to advance the kingdom of God? We're in a spiritual battle. There are promises for us, but there is almost always a price that has to be made paid before we will attain the promise of Jesus. Paul talks about here, he alludes to the, the sacrifice that Jesus made, the price that Jesus had to make so that we could live in the promise of the Father. When people see trials, when people see pain in our lives, and they see how we're responding to that pain by leaning into Jesus, then the goodness of Jesus is manifested through our lives says in verse number 12 so then death is working in us but life in you he's telling the corinthians that all of the pain that he has experienced he is trusting god to use the story of that pain to produce more and more life in the church Paul's saying that he'll pay whatever price, even the price of death. Paul will pay any price for the promise, to attain the promise, to see the promise of a healthy Corinthian church. And I wonder how many people sitting across the churches of the world today can say the same thing. I'll pay any price if it means advancing the kingdom of God. I'll pay any price. If it means following Jesus, I'll pay any price to attain the promise of God. And I could go into metal in there about all the prices that we're not willing to pay for the kingdom, but I won't. Verse number 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. He's quoting scripture there. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Piece of advice number four is this. Have faith until you can see it. Have faith until you can see it. Faith, the substance of what? What is hoped for. The evidence, unseen. Have faith until you can see it. What's he saying? He's saying that even when I can't see it, Happening, Even when I can't see the promise unfolding in my life, even when I can't see that happening, I have enough faith in the Holy Spirit that I'm going to speak it as though it is done. This is one of those verses that can be taken out of context, and you can get some really, really bad theology out of just a few verses right there if you're not careful we believe therefore we speak that can be taken as kind of this name it and claim it prosperity gospel kind of verse we believe it therefore we speak it and paul says that's true and that's good because it's in scripture and that's what we're doing as well we believe it and therefore we speak it we're supposed to speak things into existence that right now we can only see through the eyes of faith but the real theological difference there is what are we having faith for we can see that money in the checking account right come on we can see job promotions we can have faith for new cars we can use this verse out of context to pursue those things but what paul sees here in faith is totally different than pursuits of the flesh he isn't seeing his own blessing, he's actually framing his own pain. 
He's seeing his own hurt. He's speaking faith over a situation where the only thing there is left to do is to speak faith. Because his faith is not in himself or in the Corinthians. His faith is in the Holy Spirit who has so much power that he raised Jesus from the dead. It's okay to see things that are promises of God. And even when all you can do, they're not in your hand yet. They're not reality yet. When all you can do is speak those things into existence in faith, it's okay to do that. Let's just, making sure, let's just make sure that we're speaking things to advance the kingdom of God and not our own kingdom. If you need help with that one, refer back to advice piece number one for the day. Get over yourself. Romans 8 promises, I love Romans 8, it's such a good section of scripture. In my house, almost on a daily basis, multiple times a day, we quote Romans 8, 1, the beginning part especially, where it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I say it to my sons almost every night before they go to bed because I want them to know that no matter what they ever do, that they are in Christ Jesus, that they're going to follow Jesus with their life, and that means that there is no condemnation for them. You can always come back home to dad, and you can always go back home to your heavenly father. There's no condemnation in Christ because of the price that Jesus paid for us. But if you go down in Romans 8, there's so much good stuff, and it's a guarantee that God is always going to be there for us and he is going to help us. It says in verse number 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. Verse number 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose move down to verse number 36 it says as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying nothing can separate me from the love of God, and Jesus is using all things to work together for the good of those who love him. That's us. Jesus is using all things, and he's working them all together at the same time for our individual good and also for the good of the kingdom of God. So even when I can't see the entire plan, I'm going to speak faith into my weakness. Number five is verse number 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's such an awesome verse. We do not lose heart, even though we're pressed, right? We're persecuted. We don't lose heart. Our outward man may be perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. How does Paul keep going? When things are really tough, when things are hard, how does Paul keep going? He's renewed on the inside. We did a series about that a while back. From the inside out. He's renewed on the inside. Third John 1, verse number 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and in health, even as your soul is well, or even as your soul prospers. So goes the soul, so goes the inside, so goes the entire man. Our outward man may be perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. We have to pay attention to when the inward man is being renewed, how often the inward man is being renewed in Paul's life he says day by day that means every single day his inward man is being renewed in Jesus I gotta tell you nothing will strengthen you like spending time with Jesus I'm, ta I'm, not, I'm talking about spiritual strength 
certainly. But I'm talking about physical strength as well. Nothing will strengthen you like spending time with Jesus. It's supernatural. It doesn't make sense that that would give you physical strength, but it will. Here, believers saying all the time, talking about how tired they are, and I'm, I'm so exhausted, and I'm so overwhelmed, and I'm so overcome, then you need to spend some time being renewed by the Holy Spirit, because spending time with Jesus gives us strength. We should be strong and not weak. we got to move on. Verse number 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory piece of advice number six that we get from paul what we do today will matter forever what we do today will matter forever paul takes all of his pain and he puts it in his place here this is pain that paul said uh just a little bit ago in his letter that he thought was going to kill him he thought it was going to overcome him he thought it was going to take him out and now though that he's thinking about the glory of heaven he calls the worst pains of life quote a light affliction which lasts only for a moment and we could spend some time here talking about heaven and how amazing it's going to be and it's going to be amazing and it's going to be amazing for everyone who's there but heaven isn't going to be the same experience for everyone are y'all ready to talk about that yet no okay heaven's not going to be the same for everybody just like i don't believe hell's going to be the same for everyone there are going to be different levels i don't know another way to say it there are going to be different levels and it's going to be based on what paul's talking about right now paul says i have experienced deep suffering and deep pain for the kingdom of god but in comparison to the glory that i'm going to receive on the other side of this life this pales in comparison it's a light affliction compared to the exceeding and the eternal weight of glory that i'm going to receive here's the thing and we'll talk about it just for a moment and I, we have to we got to move on but one day everything that we do here is going to be judged the bible says it's going to be judged by fire right jesus is going to judge it and whatever remains we're, we're going to get that as our glory in the next life the bible talks about how whenever we're in heaven when we're there for eternity once you're in you're in it's going to be great but there are going to be rulers right there are different Levels And the Bible says that when we're faithful over a few things, that God will make us rulers over many things. There are going to be different levels. But the greatest thing about getting more glory in heaven is that the more we, we talk about it sometimes is, i uh, got another jewel in my crown. And I don't know if that's completely biblical, but the idea holds that the more glory that we have, the more glory we can lay before God. It's not about us receiving more glory in heaven. It's about us being able to worship God the, the way that we'll want to worship him when we get there. Because when we behold the majesty of Jesus, we're going to want to lay everything that we possibly can at his feet. And the more that we endure for the kingdom of God here, the more that we advance the kingdom of God here, the more glory that we're going to receive, the more that we'll be able to lay down and to worship him. There's no comparison to the things that we will face today and the glory of God that we'll experience in eternity. This isn't just good advice for us in hard times. It's good advice for our lives. What I do today will matter for eternity. Hopefully, what I do today will positively affect someone else's eternity. But no, whether that happens today or whether that doesn't happen today, what I do today will affect my eternity. It will affect my glory. It will affect my place, my status, my standing in heaven. It will affect me. We've got to move on. Verse number 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The seventh piece of advice is this. You will find what you're looking for. You will find what you're looking for. If you're having a problem in your body and you go to a dietitian, do you know what the dietitian's going to tell you? You need to change your diet. You know why? Because diet's what they're looking for. 
You go to a doctor, and they're going to run a scan, and they're going to tell you all the things that are wrong with your body. Do you know why? Because that's what they're looking for. The same ailment, you go to a chiropractor, you know what they're going to tell you? You just need to be adjusted. It'll fix everything. Do you know why? Because that's what they're looking for. You'll find what you are looking for. What are you looking for? The word look here means to aim at a target. Most literally, it means to look down a scope, to look down something, and to aim at a target. So what are you aiming at? Are you looking for, are you aiming at, are you targeting things that are seen and temporal or things that are unseen and permanent and eternal? This is what I know. You will only hit what you're aiming at. When I was a teenager, I got a bow, which is pretty dangerous because we didn't like live out in the country or anything. I was so ready to shoot it, so I went out to the backyard, pulled it back, let it fly. But my sights were a little bit off. So when I let it fly, it flew through the window of our shop and into the garage door. The arrow stuck in the garage. It was not a good day for me. But you know what happened? I thought I was aiming right. But whenever I put the peep sight in, if you know about bows, when I put the sight in, I I put it in wrong. And so even though I was looking through the peep sight at uh, the, what's the thing? No, the pins, thank you. The pins that I was supposed to be looking at and the peep sight that I was supposed to be looking at and I thought I had it all lined up and I thought I had it all just right and I took my breath and I let it go. If the sights are off, then nothing else matters. What are you talking about, Pastor? Make sure that your sights are lined up with the Word of God. Because you can try to be aiming just right, and you can be looking down the site at the pins just right, and you can miss your target by a mile, and you can cause all kinds of destruction along the way if your life isn't in line with the Word of God. Make sure that your sights are lined up with the Word of God, and make sure that you're aiming at eternal things. We go shoot bows with my grandpa. He did live out in the country, thank goodness. But I can remember messing around with him sometimes, and we were so competitive. And so we'd shoot, and one of us do better than the other. And I can remember him going and him, me beating him and him taking a shot. And then he would go, and he would mark a circle around where his arrow was bullseye I just don't think we want to stand in front of Jesus one day and have shot the one shot that we get to shoot and then get up there and try to figure out what we were aiming at sight signed up with the word of God focused on things that are going to matter for eternity it's good advice what you do today is going to matter forever. Will you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Lord, you're good. The counsel of your word is still good. Thousands of years later, your word has stood up to the test of time it's still good for us and so this morning God we open our hearts to receive your word let us not just be hearers of your word but let us be doers let us take this good advice that we got from a great apostle this morning let us take it and apply it to our lives we'll bless your name if there's anybody here this morning who's not following Jesus we want to give you an opportunity to do that In fact, I just want to invite you to go ahead and come to the front now. If that's you, if you're not following Jesus, but 
you want to be following him with your life. I want to give you a chance to do that. If you'll come down to the front, somebody will meet you here this morning. I promise you, you won't be alone. We'll begin to walk spiritual journey with you, lifelong discipleship with you. Jesus, thank you so much for these people, their faithfulness to your house. God, I pray that we're just as faithful to your word. Again, that we take it, we apply it. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine down on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Pray that you're blessed when you come and when you go. If you're in the city or in the field, wherever your feet take you, whatever your hands find to do when you get there, I pray that you do it blessed and anointed by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.